we have got Ben Lamb joining us. He is the vice president and treasurer of Agnico Eagle Mines. And Carol Banjucci is the executive vice president and CFO, chief financial officer of I Am Gold. So we're going to start. Um, thank you both, first of all, very much for joining us today for our virtual session. Uh, and I think that we have to, although this is a fixed income conference, I think we have to start uh, with a question on the markets for both of you, because obviously the overall market conditions during the COVID-19 pandemic um, have been extraordinarily volatile. Gold miners have been benefiting the most. Um, gold is off its recent peaks, but we're still at close to all time record highs around $1,900 an ounce. So I would like to start by kind of framing our discussion today with your expectations for the rest of the year and into 2020. And, and I'm gonna start with you, Ben Lam. What kind of assumptions is Agnico making about the, the longevity of the gold rally and just the outlook overall for interest rates? Well, thank you, uh, Danielle, for having me. Um, I think in terms of uh, gold price, obviously we've been around here at Agnico for over 60 years. So we've always prided ourselves on taking a very conservative approach. You know, we do understand that we are in a very volatile industry. Um, but, uh, but you know, as we continue to move ahead with our planning, we're actually currently in the midst of our planning process, our life of mine process. You know, we are still using a fairly conservative gold price, um, you know, somewhere in that twelve to $1,300 range um, for our long-term planning. So, you know, I think that really is the difference this time around from the last bull cycle in the gold, uh, uh, in the, uh, gold market. Um, you know, for the most part, us miners are, us producers are taking a very conservative approach to our long-term planning, and really with the with the goal of building up a strong foundation that can withstand the market volatility that's expected over the coming uh, months and years. I, I want to mention we're bringing in our, our third panelist now. We had a few technical problems off the top. Raman uh, Rontawa is the senior vice president and chief financial officer of Capstone Mining. So we've got three people on board now. Um, Raman, just to catch you up, I was talking about general market conditions, and I, I'm actually going to ask Carol to pick up. Um, on, on what Ben was saying. So many of the miners that I've talked to in the last year have been very conservative in, in terms of the gold prices that they're using. At what point do you start to have some confidence that maybe these higher prices above $1,500 gold are actually going to hold? Yeah, good morning, Danielle. Good to be here with you this morning. I mean, it's been a pretty challenging environment. You know, obviously, we're living through uh, unprecedented times. We're all working through the difficulties of COVID. Uh, certainly, um, everyone's paying attention to the political environment in the U.S. with the uh, with the uh, pending elections, and and I think, uh, like many of you, I'll be watching the uh, debates, uh, the first presidential debate this evening. Um, you know, there's social justice issues that we're all kind of faced with, and you know, continue to look at what's going on with the U.S. and China. Uh, Canada often falls sort of in between the two of them, and that was certainly the case with Huawei. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're certainly living through some really challenging times and uh, uh, with you know, massive deficits being ac accumulated with uh, a, a fiscal stimulus being provided, um, you know, to the market. And so, you know, so with that backdrop, you know, certainly it's very conducive to uh, a high gold price uh, currently where, you know, as you said, it's trading around 1900 uh, close to it this morning. Um, we expect that that will continue and, and perhaps even get stronger. Um, but, you know, to your question, similar to, to what Ben said, we're, we are really managing our business very conservatively. Uh, our reserves are being done at, at 1,200, our, our resources at 1,500. Uh, our budget for next year, we're using 1,600. And we do run, you know, various sensitivities. But, you know, we saw the gold price drop $100 last week. And so, I think, you know, it's a volatile market. I think that will con continue uh, into the future. And uh, at, here at I Am Gold, we are going to be very conservative and making sure that we deliver margins to uh, to the business and, and, uh, and to our shareholders. All right. And, and same general broad market question to you, Ramon. You're in a slightly different um, position than Ben and Carolyn, that Capstone gets most of its revenue from copper. And the trend, obviously, for copper since April has also been up. But you know, copper prices are not even back to the 2018 peak, much less the 2010 peak, whereas gold we've got at, at all time record highs. So it's a little bit different. What, what's your outlook? Yeah, I mean, copper, as you indicated, copper had a bit more of a bumpy ride with COVID-19. Initially, when COVID happened, just like many other industries, copper is a 
barometer of the economic health of the economy globally. Um, and copper dropped from like 275 down about 220. So unlike the gold miners, we had different uh, measures to put in place with cost reductions and managing our balance sheet uh, through a low period. And as you said, I think I think it was a little later than April, but then copper started to rebound. And it has, as Carol mentioned, it's been pretty volatile, right? So it's gone from a lows of 220, 230 up to $3 copper. So copper's moved down 20, 30% and then up past where it was pre-COVID. Um, and, and really, when you look at the outlook on copper, we're going to manage our business conservatively, just like every other miner. We run our reserves at 275. Uh, we run our planning at 275 um, and then do sensitivities. But at the same time, when you look at the copper outlook, we're bullish now on copper. Copper's had, as you mentioned, they had that little peak there in 2018, but really the last five years have been under $3 copper. Um, and when you look at why be bullish copper now, not from a planning perspective, but just from a general market perspective, the stimulus required um, post COVID-19 um, in terms of infrastructure spending to get the economies back going is backed by copper. And China's already leading the way, given they came out of COVID-19 first. And China consumes 50% of the world's copper. So that's a good indicator. I'd say one, stimulus programs. Two is green electricity. So solar and wind and electric vehicles. Um, copper is the main component. So as we look to take out CO2, copper is going to be a key component over the next few years here. And then the electric vehicle revo um, revolution. So as that takes off, copper will take off. So... The outlook, I believe, on copper now is set up to have a good five years or more um, after it's been down for a while. Okay. So, okay. so, you know, if I summarize, kind of wrap all of that together, all three of you, there's a lot of common ground here. All three of you have got, uh, you know, nice tailwinds coming from your underlying commodity prices. Fundamentals are looking good right now. You're all focused on managing your businesses conservatively, nevertheless. And the third part of the equation, which is really the, the focus of this conference, fixed income, you know, the backdrop is rock bottom interest rates. So let's dial down a little bit into each of your companies. Carol, I'm going to start with you because you could certainly argue there has never been a better time to refinance debt or to take on new debt. And you guys, I am gold, actually took advantage of market conditions to refinance um, earlier this year. Tell us a little bit about what that process was like and if there are plans to do more. Right, um, and well, again, thanks, Danielle. We actually accessed the high yield market two weeks ago and uh, we raised $450 million. And I will say with, you know, the support of the central banks, you know, we've had, a, you know, well-functioning markets. So we were able to access the market. Um, it, you know, the focus was to refinance existing bonds um, that had a coupon associated with it of 7%. And uh, and uh, mature it was maturing the bonds were maturing 2025. Uh, we refinanced at five and three quarters, and we moved the maturity out to uh, 2028. So, you know, we were very um, opportunistic. Uh, it made sense for us to do that uh, because the markets, like I said, are, are you know very deep and well functioning. Um, and what that does for us, it, it allows uh, us to support the you know our needs because we're embarking on a uh, major construction um, of a, uh, you know, it's a world-class uh, asset in, in Canada. And so making sure that we've got, you know, a robust balance sheet to allow us to, uh, you know, underpin our business strategy was really key to us. So, you know, we we're really pleased. We we're well oversubscribed and uh, just very, very successful outcome for us. Yeah, you're, you're talking about Cote, obviously, is the project. And, and I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that later on. But just the second part of my question, you know, are you tempted to borrow more? I, this is a question I want to ask everybody, just given that the conditions right now in the market are so unique, even if you don't right. need to, want to. Yeah. You know, we, you know, we're sitting with $800 million of cash on the balance sheet. We have access to a $500 million credit facility, which is vir virtually undrawn. So, you know, we're and, and now we've refinanced the bond. So we have an exceptionally strong balance sheet. And it, uh, you know, when you compare it to our peers, you know, we are, you know, we're in net uh, cash position. Uh, so we don't have any needs to access the markets any further. I mean, one of the things about being in the gold space and, you know, be just being subject to the, the volatility around the, uh, you know, the commodity price. Uh, it's really important to have a strong balance sheet to be able to weather that volatility. 
Uh, and that's historically something that we've all always operated with. And so, and that will continue. So we really feel you know, that we're fully funded, well financed in order, in order to execute on our business strategy. So we're not anticipating um, accessing the market any further, uh, just based on our current sort of outlook. Um, we are, you know, amply cashed up and, uh, and again, again, being able to access the market uh, two weeks ago, you know, was just something that uh, was important to us and it proved to be very successful for us as well. I also sit on the board of a copper company. They also came out uh, around the same time with a similar type of experience. So I think those that, you know, wanted to, to access the market are taking advantage of the current environment to do so. Um, ben, Agnico's made $200 million in debt in March, which, you know, even further back, right at the, the sort of peak volatility, middle of the market mayhem, nobody knew at that point what was going to happen. Were you not tempted to delay in the middle of all of that? <laughs> um, well, Danielle, there was certainly a lot of uh, discussion. There were a lot of uh, evenings, late night discussions as to do we go, do we uh, uh, stand back? Um, but as you mentioned earlier this year, um, Ignika, we actually decided, uh, uh, similar to uh, Carol and I am Gold, to refinance a portion of a debt maturity that we had coming due in April of, uh, of, of this year. So we had $360 million coming due. So we actually decided, given the market conditions at the time, to uh, refinance it, refinance $200 million of that uh, debt maturity um, at what was at that time a very uh, uh, good time to access the markets. Um, so as, as you mentioned, Danielle, you know, as we were about to price up a deal at the beginning of, um, of March, um, we literally lived through that, uh, at least the beginning of that volatility in, in early March as Treasuries went from about 140, 140 basis points, all the way down to 90 basis points when we actually ended up pricing a deal. So um, as we all know, you know, that eventually continued to go down to 50 basis points. Um, and I'm going to point out, obviously, that was an all-time record low for U.S. Treasuries. Um, so, you know, as you can imagine, there were a lot of sleepless nights. Um, there was a lot of discussions whether we stand back or go ahead with the deal. But at the end of the day, um, you know, as I said earlier, we've been around for over 60 years. Um, you know, we have all been experienced, uh, have experienced living through these volatile market conditions. And we took a step back and really looked at the backdrop that we were issuing this, uh, this, uh, th this debt in. And that was virtually record low U.S. Treasuries, um, very strong uh, credit spreads for miners at the time. And we ultimately printed a coupon of 2.83% for an average maturity of, uh, of 11 years in the U.S. private placement market. So I think it really, despite all of that volatility, we really took a step back and looked at what was a record low for Agnico in terms of a coupon. And we said, you know, that is, uh, you know, you certainly can't go wrong with issuing 11-year uh, paper at 2.83%. And are you done now? Um, yeah, I think, you know, we certainly are. You know, we actually repaid $160 million earlier this year, um, you know, in this type of gold, in, uh, gold price environment and with the ramp up of our, uh, our, uh, our new mines. Um, you know, we did bring into production a couple of new mines up in the Canadian Arctic last year. Um, you know, those mines continue to ramp up and are expected to perform really strongly in the second half of this year. Um, so given the current back, uh, gold price environment, given the expected strong cash flow generation, um, I would say, you know, unless there is some sort of a surprise, um, you know, we are comfortable with, uh, with, our, uh, with our balance sheet currently. Okay. And what would a surprise constitute? Well, you never know. You know, as, as, as we all know, uh, it, is, uh, it is a volatile industry. Um, there's always opportunities to continue to grow the pipe pipeline, but we are very comfortable with the current pipeline that we have. You know, we are well funded to advance that pipeline. Um, so barring uh, a, a major surprise, M&A or otherwise, you know, you can't really plan for that type of stuff. Um, you know, we are, we are, uh, we should be set in terms of uh, our uh, capital structure and our balance sheet. All right. And I want to pick up on that in a second, but um, Ramon, I want to bring you in as well, because you guys are not in this market really right now. You have a revolver, but I think that's it. If the terms are attractive enough, which they would seem to be right now, would you be tempted to issue debt, to shore up your balance sheet, to raise capital for projects for, for 
anything at all, how, how would you fund your plans going forward in this market? Yeah, I mean, it, when you look at ours, we have a 300 million revolver. Um, we've been approached obviously by banks, whether we want to replace it with a high yield note, given the markets are at attractive terms. But from our perspective, the size of the company with five to 600 million of revenue, we, we're looking to kind of delever our balance sheet. We're net debt 165. And if we can get a little lower with some creative precious metal ideas, um, you know, we, we can take that balance sheet. COVID-19 has kind of showed us, you know, you want to be uh, a modest use of debt. And so we run our debt targets using lower copper prices than we say do our reserves at maybe 225 or uh, 250 in terms of what, what kind of debt levels we want in terms of our ratios. So I'd say we're looking not to take on more debt, but to kind of um, delever our balance sheet even a bit further if we could. Um, and then as we have some growth in front of us, like a project in Chile, a billion dollars CapEx or more, um, in terms of fin financing that, there's different streams. You just talked about gold taking off. So that project has copper, gold, iron ore. So the gold is worth, you know, a couple hundred million dollars there. Um, we can also look at project debt financing if required. But I mean, the high yields are obviously attractive. So we to analyze all the alternative alternatives to see what debt structure makes sense for that project in the future. Yeah, and you're you're at a different um, place in the investment sort of spectrum right now but capstone has never paid a dividend what what is the plan for free cash flow if copper prices hold around three dollars or or if they even improve based on all the the fundamental tailwind that you're getting that you talked about at the top of this yeah i mean if we look at our shareholder base i, I don't sure believe any of our shareholders are a dividend uh yield holder in terms of capstone they're buying us for optionality to copper they're buying us for optionality and expiration um, and the growth. So our 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 free cash flow is reinvested into our business units um, and into making sure the balance sheet is managed properly. So we believe that's kind of the best use of capital for us rather than paying a dividend. Okay. And and same question to you, Carol, because cash flow is obviously such a huge topic of conversation among gold miners right now, um, with lots of pressure to return more of the windfall to shareholders. Um, you, you've got the, the huge spend for the Cote Gold project in Ontario this year. Where do you sit on the possibility of a dividend? Because I, I don't think IM Gold has paid one since 2013. That's right, Danielle. Uh, you know, look at we, uh, you know, as we look at our growth strategy, um, I guess, I guess, first of all, let me say that definitely with, you know, current gold prices, uh, you know, the gold sector overall is generating, you know, good cash flow and uh, and a number of companies out there are paying a dividend. And you know, we're in a bit of a different uh, position right now. We've got this, you know, tier one asset that we're looking uh, to uh, to put into production. It's a $1.4 billion U.S. spend. Uh, in the first, you know, it's it's got a mine life of 18 years plus. In the uh, in the first uh, five years of production, we're producing close to you know 500,000 ounces at 100%. This is a joint venture with Sumitomo, where we own 70%, they own 30%. Uh, it's it's a, this is a clear path to a real transformational change for IM Gold. Uh, we're going to go up from pr producing 700,000 ounces to over a million. Our all-in sustaining yeah. costs are expected to be below a thousand. So. For us, the priority is really around execution of this project because it's such a phenomenal opportunity for us and it really changes the game for IM Gold. But look, at if gold prices continue to rise uh, and we start to continue to, um, not start to, but we continue to accumulate cash, is something that we'll definitely have to take a look at. And it's definitely part of the conversation that we're having with our shareholders. Okay, and and Ben, again, the the same question to you. You know, the the sort of comments that Carol was just making really remind me of similar comments that Sean Boyd was making a few years ago when you guys were ramping up the Nunavut operation. So you've come through that now. Um, you're at a really different place. You've got this amazing tailwind coming from higher gold prices. Do you send more of that to shareholders, or do you look for the next big opportunity? 
Well, Danielle, it really is a combination of all of that stuff. I think uh, you're absolutely right. You know, coming out of uh, the construction bill and, and, and build phase that we're coming out of uh, in 2019, we're certainly very well positioned. And it is certainly at the forefront of a lot of our discussions. Um, Agnico, as you're likely aware, has paid a dividend for over 37 years. So it is a very important part of our business. Um, you know, we do value that this is uh, not just our company. This is also, the, we, we do have uh, owners who are looking to uh, benefit and participate in the current gold price environment. So that certainly is at the forefront of our discussions. We are very much focused on increasing the owner's dividend. Um, it is something that we're having a lot of discussions about. And certainly in a rising gold price environment and in the position that we are in, uh, the position to benefit from uh, uh, the increasing cash flows, we certainly would look to return a, a, a fair amount of that to our shareholders. But, you know, we also are uh, well aware that this is a long-term business. Um, you know, we do have to continue to reinvest in our business as well um, and continue to focus on growing that pipeline, developing that pipeline, um, and ensuring that that cash flow generation continues for many, many years. So it is finding that right yeah. balance Danielle, it's a volatile industry and, you know, we've been able to uh, to survive and we've been around for over 60 years. And part of it is because we have been able to uh, to, to find that uh, uh, perfect balance in terms of capital allocation. But if the priority is protecting the dividend for shareholders, which seems as though it has been a priority for Agnico over the history of the company, really, then as those huge opportunities come along, this, this sort of leads back to what you were saying earlier when we were asking about, when I was asking about what a surprise would look like. Um, I mean, are, are you guys looking for the next best thing? And, and if you are, would you fund it with debt? Well, you know, we're always uh, keeping our eyes open, Danielle. I think, you know, we wouldn't be doing our, 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 uh, our owners and shareholders, uh, we certainly would be doing them a disservice if we didn't look forward and continue to look for opportunities to grow that pipeline. I think uh, as we've demonstrated here at Agnico, you know, we have always taken a very balanced and measured approach to any M&A opportunities that, that, that do come up. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the Agnico has, um, you know, we've done relatively small deals in our 60 year history. Only once have we done a significantly large deal. And that was back in 2014 when, along with our partners, Yamana, we, we acquired uh, the Canadian Malarctic mine. Um, so I think it is something that we always uh, uh, keep in mind. We do make sure that we do find that balanced approach, you know, certainly very, very uh, attractive cost of debt these days. But, you know, we certainly uh, uh, have to find that perfect balance and we wouldn't do everything via debt if that opportunity did come up. The time has gone so quickly. I I'm going to ask you all one last question around sustainability. There's actually a question from the audience asking whether the panel can talk about um, sort of the, the impact of sustainability on operations. And, and I specifically, um, Ben, I'll, I'll throw this one to you first, would like to know how much ESG questions come up among fixed income investors, because we know that equity investors really care about this in the gold space. And it's one of the things that's, that's helping sort of attract people, generalist investors to certain gold companies. What are you hearing from fixed income investors? Can give you each about 30 seconds. Yeah, no, it certainly is a very uh, important topic nowadays, you know, not too different from equity uh, investors. You know, 10 years ago when Igneco first uh, accessed the debt capital markets, um, it wasn't a very common question. But nowadays, it's a very important part of uh, our, our marketing. Um, you know, we do get asked a lot of questions because investors also have to do, do, do their own due diligence um, because they, in turn, are also asked the same questions from their investment committees and credit committees. So, you know, it is uh, it is become very important and becoming increasingly important. It's so certainly something that Ignico does a very good job of. Okay. Actually, I changed my mind because we're running out of time. I'm going to give you all a different question to end with. So, um Roman, I'm going to ask you about uh, your currency assumptions going forward, because both you and Ben have operations in Mexico and you also have a presence in Canada. Um, means your costs are in those currencies. Gold, obviously, copper are denominated in U.S. dollars. So how concerned have you been about U.S. dollar weakness through the pandemic and potentially into the election? 
Um, I mean, it's hard to predict, as you as you can imagine. But when COVID nineteen happened, I, I could just tell you when we see opportune, just like Agnico, probably uh, times in the currency, you know, the Mexican peso and the Canadian dollars went the wrong way, and and for us, copper went crashing. But what we did was opportunistically actually hedge uh, the Mexican peso and the Canadian dollar to lock in some of those cost savings for years out, and fuel prices as well for our American mine, uh, just because you know you, you get these once in a lifetime opportunities maybe to jump in at some really low cost. And so you can never, I guess, technically project the currency markets, but when you see a rate we really liked, we got into the Mexican like at 23, 24. Um, so we're kind of happy with that strategy. All right, and Carol, we're out of time, but I'm gonna just squeeze in one very last short question, um, sort of on, on what could pop this euphoria that we're seeing in the gold market. What keeps you up at night? What is the biggest risk right now? You flicked at the election at the top of, of the conversation. I don't know if it's geopolitical uncertainty, but there's a lot going on right now. What makes you nervous? Yeah, I think, Danielle, it's what you just touched on. I think there continues to be a lot of uncertainty around the marketplace. I think, you know, uh, I think, you know, the worst of COVID is behind us, but it's not totally behind us. We've seen a resurgence uh, certainly in uh, Toronto, cases are up for 400. Uh, uh, in Ontario, at 700. We're beginning to see the Quebec government, in, 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 you know, bring in some additional restrictions. So, you know, uh, you know, I, I heard Dr. Fossey speak on Bloomberg uh, just uh, a week ago, and he was saying, "Look, a vaccine is 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 hopefully coming by the end of the year." Uh, but uh, you know, in terms of everybody being vaccinated, it won't happen until the end of next year. So, I think. You know, there's still a backdrop of a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace. And I think, you know, as everybody talked about, it's important that we remain very uh, diligent around uh, making sure that we manage our operating sites appropriately, uh, keep people safe and uh, and keep strong balance sheets to deal with the volatility that we're seeing in the marketplace.